on his so way. Just us chickens. If it's okay with you, we'll stall instead. Oh, they're chickens. Yeah. All right. Soccer for chickens. Yeah, it's chickens. And shall I? Shall I jump in? Yeah, yes, please. Sure. Sir. sure. Oh, goodness, that's very, sir. very sensitive. <laughs> oh, that's Meg. Yeah. Right. Megan Graswell. Yeah. Well, thank you. So this is our an annual update, um, which is our best practice that we've been doing for. 18 years, to be honest, we're, um, you know, we like to sit down with, you know, the city council and, and bring you up to date with what's new with the drive, some of our initiatives, you know, just make sure there's a good, you know, solid dialogue you know, between us as we go forward. I mean, there's no question. Good afternoon, Lily. There's no question to us, anyway, that this is our most important partnership. I mean, we have partnerships with lots of organizations across the region. Um, but the partnership uh, started with between the Greenville Drive and the city of Greenville in late 2004, and uh, it's continued very strong today. So, I mean, that's something that we treasure greatly. Um, I think it also, I should say that I didn't realize this was going to be Shannon's initial meeting um, <laughs> as city manager, um, but just from a personal standpoint, and I've been around, not necessarily Greenville, but around the world, um, longer than a lot of you and uh, it's always <laughs> great to see when someone who's got significant expertise and significant work ethic and the like gets recognized and promoted but when that individual i'll just say also has a a heart for the city and a heart for the work that she does and they have that all in one person mm -hmm. i think you guys have made a wonderful wonderful we choice and so. we think so too <laughs> You want to hire up with the driver? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Too bad. Or Hands least, off. A lot less stress. Except when it rains. Except when it rains. Smart enough not to do that. Uh, yeah. it's stressful too. Uh, but no, our last time together was uh, May the 9th. And so it's been a little over, over a year. And there's no ask at the end of this. So you can all just take a deep breath and relax and just, you know, kind of enjoy. But there, there has been some very significant developments in the world of baseball. Um, that I think it's important as partners just to bring you up to date with what's going on, what's keeping us at night, up, up at night and the like. So today, um, you know, three main topics, um, you know, floor field facility updates and what we're calling the West End Entertainment District, the progress we're making on that. Um, talking about our community uh, programming and, and drive programming and uh, then an update on uh, minor league baseball, major league baseball, um, what's going on there. I will say on the facility side, um, there's been more construction and related construction activity than, than ever. Um, that involves District 356, and hopefully you've seen that firsthand. And then the facility standards that we've also completed in response mm -hmm. to Major League Baseball. Um, and the city was very helpful in assisting us with some of the financing you know, behind that. So we certainly want to say thank you, and we're most appreciative for the assistance on the facility side and so we want to give you a sense of what what all we've invested in along mm -hmm. the way on the community programming um jeff will cover that in detail but that's um that's our secret sauce if you will i mm -hmm. mean at the end of the day thinking of thinking of it like technology the the hardware is important but the <clears throat> the magic is really in the software and in our baseball business is the same but the stadium is, is wonderful and it's very important, but the, it's really the programming that we do that um, kind of makes that come to life and, and really builds the partnership. And then uh, back in January 2021 was the new player development system that was, I'll use the word, imposed on us by Major League Baseball. Um, and now we're in the two and a half years into that relationship and just like any new business. Um, there's some surprises along the way. There's some things that are good, some things that are not so good, and just keeping that uh, keeping that dialogue in, in front of you. You've, for those of you who've seen this slide, you've seen this slide before, but our mission hasn't changed. We're steadfast, um, you know, and it's great that Lillian's here. I mean, she's the one who coined the phrase back in June of 2005, when we were digging the hole for floor field, and she said, this is more than about baseball. And to be very honest, I wasn't fully aware of everything you meant with that statement, but it really has you know, come to life. Is this, this is much, much more than about baseball. And our business isn't the business of baseball. We're in the business of making memories and making the upstate a stronger community. And you know that, and I know you're all looking at different economic development councils and 
we very much see ourselves as an economic development asset for the city, for the county, and, and for the region. And uh, so making the upstate a stronger community is something that um, is what we are all about. Hopefully you'll look at this slide and, and I would just say sometimes a picture is worth a mm -hmm. thousand words on mm -hmm. the, those are the same picture, um, just 18 years separated from 2005 to what um, basically the floor field site looked like in 2005 and on the right is what it looked like um, recently. <clears throat> That's a great shot. Yeah, it's a great mm -hmm. shot. You know, we'd never seen, uh, I walked out there with Lillian one cold Saturday Saturday morning or mm -hmm. something, maybe Friday morning, but anyway, never, and I'm serious, never seen so many syringes mm -hmm. in the ground in, in one place. It was just unbelievable, the drug activity. This is back in 05. In that mm -hmm. Yes, back in 05. <laughs> <laughs> what were those buildings along Main Lazy. Street? Were they abandoned warehouses or? And there was a, a chemical company on the end over there. You can see Green Avenue cut right, 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 right yeah. through the, mm -hmm. the site. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, so it's been a wonderful journey, um, you know, and, and the, the bigger Greenville becomes and the more diverse it becomes and the like, I mean, the more we can't, to me, ever take this story for granted. Mm -hmm. um, it was a lot of intentional activity by many of you around this table that, that created and, and made the West End, you know, what it is. And we're... We're very proud of the role that we played in the development of the West End. Um, you know, back then I had no intention of moving to Greenville. Greenville's now our home. You know, we've got two of our three kids and five of our six grandkids that live here. And so it's been just a, a wonderful story. Um, the ballpark was ballpark of the year in 2006 when it came on stream. Um, we were acknowledged by an editorial that become the front porch of the community in mm -hmm. 2011, which is the positioning that we really embraced um, and try to live out that, uh, that walk. We were named the top team in all of baseball um, in 2017. There were 160 teams um, at that stage. More recently, we've led the league in attendance for four straight seasons. Um, we do have one of the smaller venues, um, so the league to league, league to league in attendance was one of the I call it more intimate, not smaller, but one of the more intimate venues. Um, it's quite an accomplishment. And the bottom there is Dry Baseball plus West End Events, which is our kind of events organization, really has become you know, our year-round home to our community's highest profile events, mm -hmm. you know, Artist View and Euphoria and um, Mansion Upstate and, and other um, significant community events in addition to Dry Baseball, Carolina Clemson Baseball, and the like. Um, so all has to say there's a there's a drive season, a post season, a Christmas season, and a preseason, but there's no off season. Uh, <laughs> so, so. When I this, took um, my grandkids to the uh, Christmas thing, we had the train going around. Yeah. So so later on, they were taken to a baseball game. They wouldn't know where the train was. <laughs> well, the train's been they in remember the right field. Yeah. Where, where's the train? <laughs> Next December. <laughs> I'm disappointing. It's just they wanted it that night. <laughs> Unfortunately, the train is called Norfolk Southern Railroad. But <laughs> yeah. I think you're Ooh. thinking of a different one. Mm -hmm. But I mean, these were um, actually for Mary Douglas back in the fall of 2021. We haven't, you know, we've never done a, a community impact study per se, um, but uh, these are numbers from the, from the city. Um, so clearly, I think Floorfield has. Been the catalyst for the renaissance of the West End. You know, you can see the number of new building permits, the property values, and these are exclusive of, of uh, County Square and exclusive of anything to do with Unity Park. Um, in terms of new business licenses, number of sales. On the right side, um, you know, I think very important number of you know, multifamily developments, 400 Red Becca, Southridge, 408 Jackson, Suncap to come. Um, and then what I'm calling, and I think we're all starting to call it now with the West End uh, master planning that was done a, an emerging entertainment district that includes District 356, includes the Bellwether, which is the former Liberty Tap Room, the Children's Theater, Gather Greenville, you know, Markley Station, not quite sure of the status of the Kimpton Hotel, but the New Rome Brewing Company coming in the Cigar Warehouse. So there really is an emerging kind of entertainment district amidst the Multi-family developments that are coming. Is that no other place open for lunch yet, or is it just in? Not for lunch, uh, just yet. 
um, that's um, where did Liberty Tap went. Well, I know. I've Steve Dow ate there last week. It's not open for lunch. Four o'clock. Yeah. Maybe he just had an yeah, early yeah, dinner yeah, there, but he said it's time. very, very good. Is, you know, I know it's good. That's what he said. Yeah. He's a connoisseur. <laughs> <laughs> food. Yeah, food made by other people. Uh, <laughs> very good. Well, but <clears throat> so that's that's kind of where we've been, and I think this is a little bit of a view as to the the direction that we're we're going. Well, there's a couple um, kind of pivot points. I mean, one we tell our our staff kind of every day that I mean, there's incredible pride in the 18 years of progress and community impact and the work that we're doing. And, but we also have this kind of relentless lens on continuous improvement and we can never um, be satisfied with the impact that we've had to date. We always have to be thinking about the community and how can we add more entertainment quality and more impact and, and um, um, just, you know, more, more benefit to the, to the community in general, more memories. And when you look at, um, kind of side by side, the you know the impact of what we've done with the, the ballpark on a year round basis, and then adding District Three Fifty Six in the last year, and what that's done for us from a just a year round event standpoint, um, it's really transformed our business. I mean, we've, we've really made an intentional pivot in the last four to five years. To, to this is about a lot more than just base, the baseball season and year round community events. And District Three Fifty Six has really taken that to the entirely new. Um, looking at a couple of the featured projects that have taken place at the ballpark. So you're up to speed on kind of everything that's happened for really starting with the facility first ballpark um, based on a lot of those kind of the new major league baseball facility guidelines and the rules that are guiding the entire industry. Um, we have to make some very significant updates to the ballpark. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I mean, the first kind of marquee update is this is what people don't see very much is the, everything that's actually underneath the 500 club area of the ballpark. And We're welcome to a range of private. Yeah, tour. it's spectacular. Uh, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, there's 8,000 new square feet of, of space in the, in that 500 club area. And when we look at the, what we've done from a player clubhouse, locker room, technology spaces, you know, meeting areas, you know, brand new, um, transformed weight room, kind of training room area, um, we really branded it nicely, kind of telling stories of the drive and the Red Sox. And this is the featured area where the players are spending all of their time, so really telling that story of all the alums that have come through and the like. Um, and the whole player facility side of the ballpark has been transformed um, based on these these new guidelines. But the, so that's that's uh, you know, the pictures do uh, don't, don't even really do it justice when you look at the, all of the work that's been done. A lot of standpoint, and some of these quotes are just I mean they're we in. The way we interpret the quotes too is there's just should be pride from everybody that's involved in this project in the community when we see i mean these are quotes from players that have come through staff of other teams major league baseball leadership and the like and we've heard it for years and we continue to hear it now that you know greenville sets the standard not just from a facility standpoint from a community from a city you know this is as good as it gets in terms of minor league baseball we continue to we continue to hear it and then some of the less kind of maybe not quite as sexy updates at the locker room, but other kind of facility updates that we um, you know, needed to make from a facility standpoint, you know, netting the entire park, which was critical for us from a safety standpoint. Um, we had to also from a safety standpoint, but also aesthetics added pads to the entire outfield, uh, which really updated the look and feel of the whole outfield and uh, really improved the aesthetics there. And the update that's coming actually next year, 24, is where totally gutting and redoing the lighting at the ballpark would be, um, that would be across the board, both in terms of the product and the system um, standpoint. So when you think about some of those higher end football games that you've been to with the lights and the things you can do from an entertainment standpoint, that's really gonna transform our ability to bring lighting into the fan experience that we're excited about. So, I mean, a good a couple of good examples. Back on the prior slide, the two drive mannequins, I mean, that's, Something you might see at USC or Clemson's football area, you'll never see in a minor mm -hmm. league park, but we want to do that extra. And then on the LED lighting, the minor league minimum is a hundred candle power across the outfield and the major league standard at all the major league parks is 125. Mm -hmm. So brighter lighting. So we're, you know, we're going to the 125, you know, mm -hmm. standard um, mm -hmm. just because we're, we always like to, just surprise people sometimes with some unexpected things and to have superior lighting. I mean, you can't do many more things for your players because most of the games are at night and to have 
superior lighting mm -hmm. is something the Red Sox and Major League Baseball will both very much appreciate. Did the Jack Porter group do y'all's inside for the it, mannequins? It was actually our uh, architect, DLR, out of uh, St. Louis, oh. who designed the ballpark originally and then handled all the major renovations. They have a experiential graphics team that did the work. We worked with Christina a lot in 2017 when we did um, some of the, the 500 Club in the mm -hmm. uh, She's a season ticket holder. So mm -hmm. Good relationship there. <laughs> and then in terms of um, District 356, so uh, and this has been our first full season, both kind of the event season and baseball season, to activate District 356. <clears throat> and, um, it's more than lived up to our expectations <laughs> and um, just capabilities of what we can do from a entertainment standpoint. I mean, it's again, it's modeled after Jersey Street and Fenway Park in Boston, which is their entertainment um, area right adjacent to the ballpark that they use for to activate all the events that happen um, within Fenway. So that's the model that we've used here. Um, just being able to take the fan experience, the entertainment quality that fans have really come to expect inside the ballpark and have it start on the street. And um, you know, starting the, you know, the marquee events in Greenville are, are anchored here in one way or another. When you think of the Art Spheres opening night gala, and Knox, you mentioned the Kringle Holiday Village has had an opening night component to, to Kringle here. That community health fairs. I mean, we've had all kinds of different um, event types with baseball and without, and it's really transformed our ability to host um, community events and just an additional way, which is pretty good. And then, kind of part of the the um, District 356 project is is also down towards Augusta Street too, which uh, yeah. So this is probably a District 356 extension, if you will, which. Um, Essentially, when we went before the design review board, if you haven't done that, I recommend that for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, it was very quite, I mean, people joke and I do as well, but their input was very helpful, at least I thought it was. And they felt we had more landscaping and the like as we came down to Augusta Street. And the comment was we needed to take, take that urban feel that we had achieved along District 356 and extend that more urban feel right through to Augusta Street. And I let them know that was working with Duke Energy and working with Norfolk Southern Railroad because it was their property and that's not always easy to do. But we've been <laughs> successful in um, basically coming up with the design that you're saying that uh, um, the review board is very happy with it. Um, working with Nick and Shannon and others from the city, we we're in the process of relocating the, the traffic signal, the control boxes that are there, kind of cleaning up that, mm -hmm. that corner, um, continuing the urban feel. And, and I think it'll, I mean, I think it really you know, presents itself very nicely. And then if you think ahead a few years to the master plan on the GTA side of the ballpark, I mm -hmm. think it marries itself ultimately well with the master plan that's been developed and right across the more green space on that side of the, the master plan. So mm -hmm. we're very excited to uh, be you know, working with the city and working through uh, the District 356 um, extension. And then continuing that to put a little uh, emphasis on the, the bellwether, which we talked about that opened in April. Um, we significantly opened up that space. Um, we uh, enhanced the patio, we enhanced the walk along Main Street um, and just change the whole feel to it. Um, it's, it's operated by the same individuals that operate the urban rent. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so far, so good. The Suncap Development Project, that's the West End Community Center um, for the a and &E Church. Um, that's, um, you know, we had a vacant lot that we contributed towards that project. Um, you all have been amazing. It took, I know it took a, a while and a lot of cooperation from a lot of people, but they're, when they build that parking garage, <clears throat> which will be wrapped by the apartments, I've come to understand, I know more about development now than I ever have, but I've come <laughs> to understand that most multifamily only build parking for the people that live there. And through investment from the city, there's um, 125 public parking spaces that are going into that development and that's you know we only have one chance to impact our next door neighbor and uh, that's not necessarily going to solve the parking challenges in the west end but i think it's a it's great for us and we were very thankful to have that happen and and uh, 
so wanted to formally say thank you all. When, when are they going to start? Anybody have word on that? I just um, probably, I mean, I was told third quarter, um, so sometime soon. Um, quite honestly, I've been county square as well, not wanting to ask too many questions for sure that somebody <laughs> might start. <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> We're trying to get to September 4th. Now we made the playoffs, so now we've got to get to September 14th, I think it is, to yeah. uh, be through the season. But it's, I mean, it's imminent in terms of when they'll, when they're starting. Are they through all the permitting processes, all the planning, all the reviews? Suncap is, it just seemed to go on forever. I didn't know if we ever reached the end of that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, and part of it was adding the parking that had kind of gone down a section, and then we were able to kind of get the parking reintroduced. And the city was very cooperative. Suncap was very cooperative and it's very persistent. So we anyway, got that. <laughs> and the little spot helps. Yeah. And then the new round brewery, that's the cigar warehouse. Um, they've now broken ground. Um, and uh, that will be, I think, a world-class brewery and a scratch kitchen, again, adding to the entertainment district. And if you haven't yet, I, if I'd have known it was Shannon's first day, I would have brought a rally view of travel to a lager for each of us. It's probably not appropriate, but um, partnership with New Realm, we've launched Rally Bill Lager, which is the official beer of the Greenville Drive. And joking aside, it's a Vienna lager, and it literally is the top-selling uh, craft beer in the upstate. It's been a very successful having been introduced early in April. So we're very excited about that. So so everything that you've just seen, that's about $12 million of expenditures that have taken place since we last, you know, got together. And, uh, you know, we're, there's a lot of, you know, effort, um, but we think it's, you know, it's like anything, you know, once you see the final product, it's something we're all very, you know, very proud of. And I think it adds to already what was a a world-class facility, and I think it just makes it that much more uh, memorable. Back to... And then, um, I mean, even with all the amazing construction projects and the development that's going on, um, you know, around the, the ballpark, and continue to go, um, continue to advance. The you know, I I continue to argue that the magic of floor field. We've talked about it already. The memories, the impact is is what happens. Programming wise, inside the ballpark, I mean, people's view of, of us and our place in the community and the upstate is because of everything that's that's hosted and showcased and celebrated within the stadium. Both again, both attached to baseball games and also on a year round basis. And our, you know, we're especially proud of the last you know twelve months and the quality of our programming, the quality of our events being more relevant and impactful um, as ever. And I mean, honestly, we could spend this is only a snapshot. We could spend you know multiple going through all the different events and programs that we use um, at, at the ballpark or, or showcase, but whether it's the, the showcase in our incredible downtown with, with Drive Business Downtown event or the city's birthday, which is coming up um, on August 8th, the Green Day, um, or our Reading All-Stars program, which is, I mean, that's a showcase 16, 17-year program encouraging kids to read and celebrating academic success all across the upstate. Now we've had closer to 1.3 million kids come through that program across 17 years, which is, you know, amazing. You look at some of the reading scores coming out of post-COVID. I mean, reading is even more important today than it was, you know, two, three years ago. So, I mean, they have a reading program that's well accepted. It's partnered with Michelin. I mean, it's... Uh, I use it with my own kids, too. I mean, my oldest is eight years old, and now he's... I mean, I'm using the reading program as a way to keep him from laying on the couch all summer. So, it's <laughs> a very strategic tool. And then, I mean, diversity, equity, and inclusion... Um, Continuing to make more and more of an emphasis you know, around using the ballpark for for DEI programming specifically, um, the three things that we pulled out. We had a um, back in you know, back in April had a you know, an, Jackie Robinson Day was celebrated all across baseball, where we we uh, celebrated Jackie as part of our, our Black Spinners programming. And earlier in the day, working with Davida and the um, Rainbow Push Coalition, hosted a. HBCU career fair on the concourse before the game. Mm -hmm. We had over 30 HBCUs on the concourse. We had close to, I think we had close to 750 kids come through, mm -hmm. you know, totally free and being able to use the concourse and the ballpark in that way to um, you know, spotlight HBCUs and, and academics. It was very exciting. It was I enjoyed really it. well done. I mean, Eric, our general manager, really spearheaded that for us, working with us. <laughs> did an awesome job. Um, and then also the other boys of summer, which was our our second um, Black Spinners game back in June. Um, that's a documentary produced by Lauren Meyer. 
um, was talking about telling the story of, of uh, Negro League baseball and kind of individual stars within the in the league and um, you know all the trials and tribulations that went, they went through as they pursued a career in, in professional baseball. And it's an amazing documentary. And at that June um, Spinners game, we actually showed the documentary on the video board, a pregame screening, and then had a Q and A session with Lauren and a couple of folks afterwards um, on the dugout top. It was the first stop in a nationwide tour across various minor league facilities across the country. It was yeah, just a uh, very well attended, uh, another way to spotlight um, uh, the diversity in a, in a really impactful way. That worked out tremendously well. And workforce, you hear us, your dad, you hear me talk about workforce development often. Um, we have a you know, really a portfolio of, of uh, workforce events now attached to baseball games that um, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's teaching, whether it's um, healthcare, aerospace, innovation, we have a baseball game um, set, centered on each of those topics and celebrating the industry and then also building the workforce all in one. Um, you know, A&E night is coming up in a couple of weeks where we're going to transform the entire concourse with you know, manufacturing and engineering, um, you know, high touch engaging exhibits from about 20 plus companies in the upstate. We'll have 2,000 kids here, K through 12 students that attend on a complimentary basis on building that um, in the workforce of the future. It's just a, it's just amazing what you can do with a, a baseball stadium with, when you talk about workforce. So, again, we could spend hours on this slide in terms of the amount of time we put into it. Um, but really, the focus is we, we were always sitting down, kind of starting every day on how can we use the ballpark for good within the community. And just to put a plug in and again, thank the city for the support that you all have given to Next. Um, I know that's something fairly new in innovation and entrepreneurship. And I think that has a lot to do with where Greenville is and more importantly, where we're going. And so we have a night that partner with the city, partner with Furman, partner with Next to really celebrate entrepreneurship across the, across the platform. And I think that's been very, this will be the third, third year that we've done it um, coming up in September. So that's the facility, that's the programming, and then the, the next would be um, the update on uh, minor, Major League and Minor League Baseball. As I said, you know, it's been two and a half years in, and you know, the change is accelerating, I think it's fair to say. Um, just as a, not too many pictures on this one, which is maybe appropriate, but uh, <laughs> um, this one would be you know, just kind of going through quickly. So January 2021, we signed a a new kind of franchise agreement with Major League Baseball. You may remember 42 cities lost their affiliated baseball um, at that time as they went from 160 teams to 120. The focus was on facility, facility, facility. Focus was on an operating platform and in our mind on more corporate ownership rather than individual um, ownership. Um, Silver Lake Partners is a private equity firm. Many of you Maybe you've heard of it. It's a global technology investment firm. It has $100 billion of assets under management. Their companies have $276 billion in sales, 710,000 employees. So it's a pretty good size private equity firm. And um, they went to the commissioner of baseball and, and said, we'd like to start buying you know, minor league teams because they all have a theme. And we think there are synergies if we do that, and we think we can improve facilities as we go through that. And so they had purchased nine teams at the end of 2021, and they were authorized to buy up to 20. Um, and they were just last month um, authorized to now buy up to, to 50. And so 50 teams out of 120, um, that's 42% of the industry. So it's it's not inconsequential. It's, it's I think it's a I position it as a threat. I mean, there's other people would say it, see it as an opportunity. It's kind of like anything in life. It depends on your perspective on things. This is not a cumulative, 50 is a cumulative number. It's not, they got nine, then they got permission for 20 more, and it's not 79, it's 50. It's 50 they're is capped there. at 50 now. They now or not capped, but now they're no, up to 50. They are capped at 50 now. Whether that cap stays in place is to be determined. But is there... Um, precedents in professional sports about preventing any ownership group from having more than majority stake? Not, um, I mean, there, I mean, a lot of that has gone by the wayside with, you know, sovereign wealth funds. And I mean, private equity used to be precluded from 
getting involved with sports teams, but then the more evaluations started, you know, going up, and I mean, the LIV and golf is well chronicled and, and the like. And so, most of those restrictions are, I'll just say, seen as a bit old fashioned and and uh, have fallen, either have fallen or are falling by the wayside. Um, I mean, their thesis is to you know supercharge the growth of each club through you know sponsor sales, then operations, licensing, marketing, content creation. You know, the more that gaming, the more that, you know, kind of gambling becomes part of the sports world to have assets that can be aggregated in that way um, is, a, is a way to create value. We happen to think, um, and many other people like us happen to think that they do po uh, pose a threat, if you will, to our historical you know, ownership model, um, which is, you know, we're individuals. I mean, not everybody like here lives in the community in which they operate, but um, it's many owned by individuals who are committed to their community, committed to community issues, community, community, to community betterment. Um, and that's not to say they won't do that, but I, I think I would argue very vehemently that somebody who lives in the community who cares about the community will be much better engaged than a corporate entity who's maybe viewed more on the profitability side. Um, Does uh, Silver Lake, uh, they own currently any in the immediate area um, i mean i guess i could give you a 250 mile radius i mean what's the closest uh team that they have well they will own spartanburg i mean that's coming up in a minute um and uh i think um while they bought all the atlanta Braves, so they own gwinnett mm -hmm. they own rome um they own no, richmond um they own uh one of the other south carolina yeah mm -hmm. well they own augusta north augusta um, the jackets from Green Jackets, right? Yeah, the Green Jackets. Um, so they're, and they own from AAA down to single A. So they're, uh, they're not, there isn't a bias towards one major league affiliation or, or the like. They'll own three of the four Red Sox affiliates, um, will be the one independent affiliate, um, which again, we, we think is an advantage, but, uh, and they're offering, you know, very compelling, you know, prices to get, um, people to sell and things like that. So again, we're getting low on time. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm so sorry, going. Greg. So just <coughs> two more slides. One, so how I, I wanted to cover, I mean, it was publicized in the press, um, the Spartanburg team that's coming to Spartanburg. And we got a call April the 6th from Major League Baseball indicating that a team wanted to come to Spartanburg and, and relocate into a new $100 million stadium and mixed use project. We determined that it was a couple years in the making, um, involving some pretty high profile individuals. The Texas Rangers were selling their Kinston, North Carolina team to Silver Lake, um, and the sale was contingent upon the relocation to Spartanburg. The key players was the owner of the Texas Rangers, the, uh, Ray Davis, Silver Lake Partners, who had the backing of Major League Baseball, Commissioner Manford um, and the George Dean Johnson family in Spartanburg. Um, they were able to secure $70 million of public monies coming from the state of South Carolina, from Spartanburg County, from the city and the Spartanburg Chamber. The relocation was possible back, our territory used to be defined as Greenville plus the contiguous counties, Spartanburg and Anderson. When we signed the new agreement, it was changed to 25 miles from home plate and anything beyond 25 miles was subject to MLB discretion. The, the proposed team in Spartanburg is 27 miles from here. Um, we were given six days to offer our perspective, um, which made for one hell of a negative opening day to get that phone call and then having to respond. Um, we did respond um, with help from a lot of other minor league owners because they could kind of see their own situation kind of, you know, operating like this. We have a team in Round Rock, Texas, and all of a sudden Austin wants to own a team. I mean, there's a lot of different scenarios if you go 25 miles from where a team is as to where another team could be. So we had a lot of help. Um, we took the position that Spartanburg, Anderson, Greenville is essentially one integrated market, the upstate of South Carolina. Um, we've been very committed to regionalism. Um, you know, all of our workforce programs go across the region. We've got a big relationship with Millican, a big relationship with AFL. 
you know, all the growth here is occurring kind of in Simpsonville, Five Forks, Greer, you know, along the county line. And so if you look at the future, you know, it's going to be equidistant between Spartanburg and Greenville. So it's a significant threat, if you will, to our to our business. And but um, long story short, um, we we made a very effective presentation where Greenville, if it wasn't before, it is now very clearly on the map of Major League Baseball, the commissioner himself said that uh, he referred to Greenville and us as a model franchise, um, but we couldn't stop the momentum. Um, at the end of the day, as happens in life, kind of money and relationships you know, prevail, and there will be a, a new team in Spartanburg uh, beginning planned on April 2025. So, um, so three kind of takeaways. This is the last slide. Um, one is competition has increased. You know, I'll just say our family commitment, our community approach, you know, our resolve. I mean, we're kind of competitive people. That's nothing's going to change in that regard. But our city with the our partnership with the city is is very important. I mean, you you all have been wonderful. There's nothing else you could have done to you know to stop this, if you will. And as Jeff said earlier, our secret sauce is always going to be the, the community programming that we that we follow. Um, you know, we do need to focus on the continued growth of that West End Entertainment District with affordability and access key. And you know, part of minor league baseball, we've worked hard on keeping our ticket prices still, you know, still a nine dollar ticket and the like. Um, but we will lose 800 uh, parking spaces at County Square, thanks to Knox and others. It was going to be in April, um, so I, I think we're going to get our way through to September. Um, but Clearly for next year, those spaces are going to go away. And so we're going to have to find uh, probably some kind of patchwork solution and, and cities help some this year, and but we'll need, need an even more concerted effort for next year. We do need a long-term parking solution, um, you know, whether that's Greenville High, County Square, you know, the GPA site or the Presbyterian Church. Um, and ensuring that GTA master plan um, that Rob um, Robinson. Robinson has developed that that comes to life. Um, you know, I would say from my personal viewpoint, I don't need to own anything, but I'd like to have influence as to what happens there so that we can integrate that development with floor field. Um, and then the last point is, you know, we are in a position of strength. I mean, the Red Sox love us. We have a brand new respect for Major League Baseball. Between us, they're feeling a little guilty as to what's happened to our neighbor. Um, but the threat is is there, um, and you know the thing that struck me is that when you read the read the press release, it's you know the state of South Carolina, the county, the chamber, um, you know all you know at one Spartanburg, if you will, it all happened kind of in one meeting. Whereas for us to get alignment across our um, you know, public community partners requires like five meetings between the state and the county and the city and. GEC and the chamber, um, it's just a, a tougher process to get alignment um, than it is right now in Spartanburg on issues like we're facing. So nothing, again, I don't think there's anything you can do or I'm asking you to do just to be aware of the challenge and I'm sure there will be some, you know, asks for help along the way as we kind of navigate our way forward. But, uh, but just in summary, again, we appreciate the time, appreciate the interest, the dialogue, the commitment, love the partnership. Um, it's been life changing for us, and we, you know we just don't want to see it stopping and seeing it, it change. And, and I think great, great update. We are going to have to go in executive session, but we have five thirty meeting, and we got them. Okay. Yeah. Same, but thank you for thank coming you by. Guys. And I appreciate you everything you're doing. Work. Thank you so much. Thanks. Really good. See, thanks for coming. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. <clears throat> Mayor yeah. and Council, you have two items to discuss in executive session. The first is. Sure. A proposed lease agreement for property on Jenkins Street requiring a contract under subsection A2 of 30-470A and under the same subsection, an update on negotiations incident to propose contract for the purchase of property in the Central Business District. Okay, motion? Yep, so moved. Second. 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 Second.